What's up, guys? Rick here with your preview for this week's RBC Canadian Open. We are headed north of the border, and this kicks off an unbelievable stretch of golf. Not that we haven't been through one already, but off the top of my head, we've got uh, this week, which has turned into a, a, an unbelievable event, the Memorial, the U.S. Open, Travelers, right? I mean, we're just we're just running right now. Signature events, major championships, national opens, should be an absolute blast. We're going to take some time to go through the golf course, this field, everything in between using data, logic, and reason to try to figure out what we can for this week. Let's jump into it. This is my website, rickrungood.com. Basically, everything you see from here on out will be from there. It's a giant database for uh, fantasy golf and, and golf betting and just golf in general, quite honestly. So we've got a golf course problem, or better yet, we have a golf course problem and data problem for this week because we're going back to Hamilton. Remember, they've moved this event around the last couple of years and it was at uh, Oakdale last year when Nick Taylor won. And now we're back to Hamilton for the first time since 2019. That's when Rory won this event. Uh, he's actually won it a couple of times. Um, and then they played it in 2012. So to 12 years, there is only two instances of us going to Hamilton. So when you look at the key stats here, they're going to be, I don't want to say unreliable, but it's a very, very small sample size and it is over a dozen years. I don't know how seriously you want to put anything into this. Um, I'll show you the, the satellite imagery here in a second, but it loves putting. It loves around the green. It loves approach. It does not take into consideration driving very much. I find that to be a little bit wonky. Um, so you can use this and you can take the last 36 rounds or however many number of rounds you want and adjust the fit for these golfers and realize that some of the guys at the top, like Aaron Cockerell have very small sample sizes. So your best adjusted fits are like Alex Norton, Alex Norton, Martin Laird, Aaron Baddeley, Rory McIlroy, Ben Griffin. But I think we can attack this a little bit better. Um, I know some of you find this incredibly interesting and incredibly valuable, and some of some of you hate this part, but for a golf course that we haven't seen, that work has been done to, and it is a composite. They play two they play holes from two courses at Hamilton, uh, the West Course and the South Course. Getting the satellite imagery and starting to map it out, I, I think is is the pathway here. And the one through line as I was doing this is the guys who can carry the ball like 310 yards, I think have a pretty big advantage here. So I'm looking at distance. Now, 310 is a little bit arbitrary, but that's because it depends a lot on tees. It depends a lot on wind. It depends a lot on that. But you know, here's hole number one. If you can carry it 305, you can basically remove all of the trouble, all of the fairway bunkers here, right? You can just carry this bunker, fly it down there and not have a lot of issues. Um, hole number two, it's a little bit longer. There's just a, 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 a fairway bunker that pinches in just a hair at about 318. If you can keep it right of that or carry it, you've opened it up uh, wide open. You can you can basically do whatever you want. You've removed a lot of the trouble. Um, number three is kind of a weird hole. And, and it looks like, I mean, from the satellite imagery, and I know they've done work to this golf course, you can, you can kind of see here. So you'll either have to decide to, and again, this will be T dependent, um, you know, the fairway runs out about 310, or you could try to carry it over that into like the secondary fairway, or you could try to carry the whole thing, which would be um, like 330. Again, that'll be wind and, and weather and uh, T dependent. Par five, this one, you just got to hit kind of a big boy shot here, but everybody's going to have to hit that. So the long hitters are still going to have an advantage. Five is basically a drivable par four if you are... Um, if you are long enough, that's this, this yellow line is at 300. So 318 is the, is the pin position here. So I don't need to go through all of these holes, but as you're, as you're looking at it, the way that I envision this is a lot of the trouble off the tee is in the form of fairway bunkers and then getting uh, super wild. Well, if you can remove half of those uh, issues by driving it and carrying it 310 yards or so, um, you've removed a lot of the trouble. So looking back at, I mean, and here's another one like this, like Rory is just going to cut this dog leg at, at any point that he wants, right? I mean, this yellow line is 300. If he takes it over these trees here to the fairway, that's going to be, 
I mean, that's 321. He could go a little right of that and cut it down to like three. I mean, it's just, he can, and then he, he doesn't even bring in these fairway bunkers at all. So he, the, the ability, it's not just distance. It's almost like carry distance. If you can carry that, I think you remove a lot of, a lot of the trouble. Um, and then as the week goes on, you know, we'll get some more reports from how, thick the rough is and stuff like that. We can cover it more on the Wednesday live chat, 3 PM Eastern time. Um, Rick run good YouTube channel. And it's just, you know, it's, it's weird, right? We haven't played here in five years. Um, they've done work. It's, it's a composite golf course in general. So we don't have a lot of data, but I, I feel that the long hitters are, are probably going to have a pretty good run at this place, or at least off the tee, be able to minimize a lot of those trouble spots. And then we'll kind of work backwards from there on, on Wednesday. And when we get into the custom model here in just a second, Let's go over to the cheat sheet and start breaking down this field. Actually, before we do that, um, if you find any of this valuable, hit the like button. It helps me. goes a long way. The splash contest that we've been doing every single week is growing and it's filling faster. So this is a guaranteed purse. Uh, this week, it's up to 300 entries. It is a $5,400 guarantee. It's already one sixth full and it's Monday morning. So this is going to fill pretty quickly. So there's a link in the description if you want to get involved in this um, and get that rocking and rolling. The I, I had three entries in it last week and forgot to fill out two of them. So I'm free money in these. Um, so yeah, I think it's a pretty good place for you to uh, take, a, take a stab at it. And the money's guaranteed. We'll continue to grow it if, if the demand warrants it. Here's the cheat sheet. There are four golfers over... $10,000 led by Rory McIlroy at $12,100, Sahith Thigala at ten five, Tommy Fleetwood at ten three, Shane Lowry at ten one. A lot of interesting stuff there. I do think there's a pretty significant gap between Rory McIlroy and Sahith, and then kind of a smaller gap between Sahith and Tommy. And then Lowry, love the guy, think he's interesting. I think he's just a little bit like they had to throw somebody else in the 10K range. I'd be I'd be a lot more interested if Lowry was priced where Sam Burns is at mid nines. It's just, eh, we'll see. We'll see how it all shakes out. But um, Rory's the second longest in this field behind just Cameron Champ. He is and has shown. So 2019, this is, this is the year that we were at Hamilton. So, you know, Rory won, Lowry T2. Um, Sahith and, and Tommy didn't play that year. We saw him take apart... Uh, Hamilton in this way before, right? And you know, I don't, I don't know why. I mean, maybe it's because Scotty overshadows everybody, but Rory's having a really good season, right? The back-to-back wins at the Zurich, the Wells Fargo, a T12 at the PGA Championship is never going to be anything to sneeze at. I'll pull up his Canadian Open stuff here, just so that we can look at that and get his. Um, so here's his Hamilton numbers: gained nearly seven strokes off the tee, which. That kind of makes sense because he has a unique skill set to be able to separate himself off the tee in kind of a big way around Hamilton. Now, there's going to be questions about, you know, can he can he fit the rest of his game around this place? If you look at what he's doing recently, the approach play has been great. He's gained 10 strokes on approach over his last two starts. The short game has been great. He's uh, picked up strokes in three, in a, three in a row measured events there. That doesn't even include the Zurich Classic win. And then the putter, um, the putter has been definitely more good than bad. And, he, and it's only been, you know, below zero. So lost one and a half strokes putting at the RBC heritage. So I've got, I've got no problems getting as much exposure to Rory McIlroy here as possible. What I'm hoping for, and what I'm interested to see is how many go for Rory over Sahith. I, again, I think there's a big gap between these two, but I cannot describe how impressed I've been with the growth and maturation process that we've seen from Sahith. He is an excellent driver. He's only lost strokes once dating back to the Pebble Beach Pro-Am. That was a minuscule loss at the RBC Heritage, less than two tenths of a stroke over four rounds. And he finished second there. Um, he is becoming a much more consistent ball striker. He's a phenomenal putter. The around the green play lets him down. It does. Now these are 6,000 square feet uh, greens on average. If he can hit hit more greens than, um, than kind of his baseline, he doesn't have to tap into those, those short game situations a little bit. I'm interested in that. What I'm even more interested in is the just extreme differences that we have seen from the golf courses that Sahith has had success on. I'm just going to read off some of his best results this year. Runner up at the, at Kapalua, fifth in Phoenix, sixth at Bay Hill, 
ninth at Sawgrass, runner up at Harbor Town, 12th at Valhalla. I mean, we've run the gamut there. Major championships, signature events, the differences between Bay Hill and the Plantation Course to Harbor Town are like the three ends of a three ended spectrum, right? Like it, they're just so different. And I think that's the biggest sign of a really strong player is that they are not tied to any one specific uh, course fit. Or anything like that. So really interested to see what the public does with Sahith. I will likely be piling in one of those two in as many lineups as possible. And that is not a knock on Tommy Fleetwood. It is not a knock on Shane Lowry. I'll pull up Fleetwood's numbers here just so that we can see them. Um, you know, I'm I'm a little bit worried that Tommy's awesome, well-rounded game isn't always going to allow him to find a lot of ways to separate from the field here. I kind of need an elite skill set here. I need something, preferably you hitting the ball very far. Um, Tommy plays better at major championships, difficult conditions, a um, couple over par or a couple under par or, or you know, 11 under par, going to win the golf tournament, something like that. And his results have been fine. T26 at the PGA Championship, T13 at the Wells Fargo, T49 at Harbortown. And then he had those really great finishes, back-to-back top sevens at, at Valero and the Masters. For $10,300, you kind of need a lot from Tommy. Might have to win. And if not win, he's probably going to have to finish better than Rory and Sahith. I'm not sure that's happening. The last time we saw Tommy Fleetwood, over $10,000. I'm just going to sort here by salary. Um, It's happened a handful of times in his career. He did it on the European Tour a couple times. The most recent time he did it on the PGA Tour was 2021. If I'm reading this correctly, looks like the Zozo Championship in 2021, he was $10,000 flat. He finished T7. Um, if you look at all the times he's kind of been one of the favorites, you've gotten it's like 15 or 20 times he's been over $10,000. He has a win, handful of miscut or a couple of miscuts, mostly just finishes between 20th and 40th. Not a lot of high end stuff from the top of the board. Not that that cannot happen again. Or not that that he, that he can't break through, but that's, I think it's just a lot to pay for somebody who's going to have to beat two guys who I think are significantly in, in better spots. And then Shane Lowry, um, you know, the PGA Championship, he gained nine and a half strokes putting. That is um, the best putting performance of his career. He finished T6. Before that, he had lost 19 strokes putting in his last three measured events. Um, and t- basically 21 in his last four measured events. So that feels fluky. It feels like he's not going to, well, I'm, I'm almost certain he's not going to gain nine and a half strokes putting again. Um, if, if, even if that comes down, even if he gains three, which is something he doesn't do all that regularly, he's going to have to find other ways to, to make that up and still beat some of these guys. So this is just a stat profile that I, I, fear that there is some pretty significant regression in the 9k range very small range alex noren cam young Corey connor sam burns maverick mcneely and adam scott that is it i find this to be fascinating um i'm not entirely sure what to do here i I think that this is a spot where i would love to just continue to go back to alex noren i don't think people realize how good he's been and i'll even show you on the power rankings here last 36 rounds everybody in this field uh, it's Richard T. Lee who plays like, you know, this is raw strokes gain. So 1.8. So that is not PGA tour stuff. Rory McIlroy, number one, Alex Noren, number two, Maverick McNeely, number three. Okay. So we'll talk about both those guys, Noren and McNeely. Noren's been unbelievable. If you've watched this channel, we have been just getting a ton of value and a ton of love out of Alex Noren. He is now the most expensive that we've seen in quite some time. Although he was over 10K in Punta Cana, but that was an alternate field event. But look at these results. I mean, just well-rounded, awesome. Second shots are great. Short game has been very, very good. I don't believe this is the greatest course fit for him. I don't. Um, I worry that he's not long enough. I, what I would hope for Alex Norin is that we get reports 
from our, you know, our boots on the ground, that the rough is very, very thick, right? Like that's what, that's what would be great for Norin. And the hope would be that he could play out of the fairway, not lose so much off the tee and then tap into some of his strengths, which kind of come from there. So that would be my hope. I think that's the pathway for, for Norin. Cam Young on paper, this should be a great spot for him, right? We're talking about um, bomb it, carry distance. The concern for him would be what he did at the PGA Championship, which is he lost seven strokes on approach. Outside of that and the three that he lost at Harbortown, he's been immaculate ball striking. It's it's a major championship and Harbortown is an extreme, like I can make excuses for the guy. Harbortown is an extreme uh, one end of the spectrum course on the PGA Tour and Valhalla, listen, I was out there. It's it wasn't easy. I know they I know they kind of crushed it, but that that course was not easy. And we saw some guys put up some some really bad numbers. I'm willing to buy and say he's not going to lose seven strokes on approach again. He's going to get back to this gain two, three, four strokes on approach, use the driver as a weapon, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Corey Connors, you know, uh, I'm probably just ensuring his victory here, but just not really interested. Right. I mean, he's, he's just the king of T11 to T26. He missed the cut here in 2019 in Hamilton. Um, I think the I think I actually believe the venues that we went to in recent years outside of Hamilton have been much better for Corey Connors than than this one is. So that worries me. Um, Mc, let's do McNeely real quick. He had the round of the day on Sunday last week at the Charles Schwab Challenge, um, which doesn't really mean anything, except maybe he's vibing a little bit. But when you start adding that up to everything else that he's been doing, he's now gained strokes to the field in every single event since the Farmers Insurance Open. That was in late January, okay? And you're getting a bunch of decent results. T23 at the PGA, T17 at the Charles Schwab Challenge. This is probably going to end up being... I imagine a weaker field than the Charles Schwab Challenge, right? Because that had that had Scotty, it had Colin, it had Homa, it had um, there's somebody else I'm missing at the top. I can't remember, but the it, this is going to be like Rory and then everybody else. So I imagine the strength of field is going to be is going to be weaker here. This might be a pretty interesting spot. Again, I don't think it's a great fit for him, but his it is a better fit for his short term than it is for his long term right and his his 100 round data and all that stuff gets really really skewed because of of him trying to play through injury in 2023 this is him back healthy again which is just a really good sign and you can see that in the power rankings right last 36 rounds he's the third best player in this field behind just Norin and um and Rory finally Sam Burns is here I'm not I don't feel the need to talk about everybody but I'm having fun I just like, I don't know what happened here with Sam Burns. He is such a talented player. I believe he's the modern type player on the PGA tour. We've seen one or two rounds at a time in which he has flashed brilliance and, and just zero consistency. So I I don't have any reason to think he's going to figure it out this week other than hope. And I realized that hope is not a strategy. So, um, unfortunately, Burns is probably not going to get much exposure from me, but show me something. Let's let's roll. Let's come on, Sam. We can we can do this. Okay, the AK range. And again, if you find any of this helpful, hit the like button. It really helps my channel. So I don't I don't find this to be super exciting, but I think there are a couple of of dart throws here. Firstly, if we go to the trends tool, we can see who's playing above and below their baseline. The first 8K golfer that we get to is Aaron Rye. He's eighty nine hundred dollars. He is playing about. Uh, po- uh, not about exactly 0.14 strokes over his baseline, which turns him into a 0.83 golfer. So using his baseline, then using the way that he's trending. Um, so he's the first guy, the best guy in the 8K range that shows up. Uh, Keith Mitchell and Akshay are not far behind. Akshay is basically playing to his own his baseline here, just just right at it. Um, Keith Mitchell, however, is playing a third of a stroke over his baseline, and he's doing it with the T to green game. In fact, he's actually not even putting all that well um, compared to his 100 round self, but he's picked up two thirds of a stroke from T to green. So I imagine I'm going to scroll down here and look at the breakout candidates tool. I think Keith Mitchell is going to be on the correct side of this. Let's see. Uh, where are you? Yeah, he's right here. Okay. So you want to be in this upper left-hand quadrant. That is guys who are 
hitting it above their baseline from uh, tee to green and then putting below their baseline. The idea being if they get back to putting regularly and some guys that's good, bad or indifferent, they have a lot of juice to squeeze out of their game. Um, the, it gets a little skewed because Mike Weird. We've got very small data on on Mike Weird. Plays a lot on the Senior Tour, so some of these some of these smaller sample size guys stretch out the uh, graph a little bit. But it is still like you can still see who, who guys who are on the correct side here, like Norin, Maverick McNeely, Keith Mitchell, Bryce Garnett, Shane Lowry, Harry Hall, Johnny Vegas. All those guys are in the correct quadrant. If you're not there, you want to be in the upper right quadrant. Uh, if you're not there, you want to be in the bottom left quadrant. Although that's not great. And then if you are, if you have no other option, you don't want to be in the bottom right quadrant, which means you are not hitting it as well as you normally do, and you are getting lucky with the putter. So that's just like the the worst place to be. But this makes Keith Mitchell pretty interesting here. The way that his stat profile shakes out and the fact that he does have an elite skill set, the driver. And I'm not a big, like I don't play, I don't have a lot of exposure to Keith Mitchell most weeks. I know he's very popular in um, in our industry. I just, I mean, I look at this profile and I see a guy with a bunch of, you know, T17 to T37s and I, I don't get super excited about it. But I think that this is a a pretty good opportunity to get in on Keith Mitchell. And, and again, I, I don't, if you play him every week, just play him again. If you are trying to pick your spots, this feels like a, a, a pretty decent spot. You can see the ball striking metrics are immaculate. The putter is, um, it's getting there ish. And the distance off the tee is what I'm really, I'm really excited about. Okay. So he's 15th in driving distance on the PGA tour. He's got a, you know, great club head speed. He's seventh from T to green. He's fifth off the tee. So there's a lot of good stuff there. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, Hamilton is, is a better spot for him. He has, he did not play here in 2019. He did play the Canadian open in the last two years. He missed the cut last year in T seven the week before. The uh, the other guy that popped up there was Akshay, but he's just kind of playing to his own baseline. He's coming off two two straight missed cuts. It, you know, it's interesting. The one that I, I'm trying to figure out is Tom Kim, right? And we've been tracking uh, Tom here for, I mean, obviously like all year, but I, I'm just waiting for something to happen. Um, the putter since the Texas Open has been good enough for me. It is not the elite level of putting that we saw when he first broke onto the tour or anything like that, or when he's got a couple of his wins, but it's good enough. He's driving it a lot better. PJ Championship, he picked up six strokes uh, off the tee, 2.6 last week at the, at the Charles Schwab. Awesome. We need to fix this. It's the second shot, which was, uh, and still remains, you know, Tom Kim's weapon. Right, that that's that's supposed to be his weapon. When he came on tour, the numbers were outrageous. We've got to fix that, and they are getting <laughs> better. So he lost three strokes on approach at the Wells Fargo. He lost half of that at the PGA Championship, and he was almost a zero at the Charles Schwab. So if we continue in that direction, we're going to get a pretty decent week. Um, the other thing that I wanted to look up for Tom Kim. Oh, I want to look him up on the trends tool here because I bet you uh, he's probably one of the hottest off the tee guys. Is that true? Where are you, Tom Kim? Did I scroll past you? Well, actually, I guess I could just do it by salary. He's in the 8K range. Find him that way. Here we go. Tom Kim. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, approach is what I was referring to. He is down a half a stroke to himself. So last 36 rounds compared to his 100 round baseline, he's losing half a stroke on approach to himself. It's a huge number. It's a huge, it's one of the biggest losses you're going to get in this category. Actually, Kuchar's down to himself, Snedeker. I mean, these are guys that don't contend anymore, right? Um, Fleetwood's down pretty significantly to himself and Tom Kim down to himself in approach. Now, Fleetwood has picked it up around the green and with the putter. Tom Kim has not. Okay. So Tom Kim is basically his 100 round self off the tee around the green and with the putter, but he's losing a half a stroke here. I don't know what this diatribe means, but I'm hopeful, right? I mean, just, just a stat guy. Like I'm hopeful that he can progress. Is that what it's called? Back to himself. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't have any, I don't have anything else to say there. Here's Nick Taylor. Um, won this event last year, did not win it here, finished T27 at Hamilton. Uh, shout out to my Canadian friends. Whoops, not Hamilton, Nick Taylor. My Canadian friends who this week, um, uh, they released a Nick Taylor bobblehead 
If you know anything about me, I love a good bobblehead, love bobbleheads. And they immortalized uh, the Nick Taylor, you know, the club throw when he throws the club after making the putt to win the Canadian Open last year as a bobblehead. Limited edition. They didn't sell many of them. Only shipping to Canada. So I tried to I tried to go and buy them. I was like, I'll buy like 100 of these. I don't care. They only ship to Canada, which is probably how our Canadian friends feel all the time when they can't get stuff shipped or their Netflix is different or whatever. But I was like appalled by that. So um, luckily, uh, I've got some good friends in Canada who were able to uh, send me one. So all, all good. I will have that on the shelf as soon as possible. I was trying to pull up a profile here and hoping to see some good stuff out of Nick Taylor, and, I, and I'm and i not. Um, the four straight events in which he's lost strokes on approach is, is very concerning, considering the fact that he, from the Sony Open to Valspar, was a big gainer in that category. If that was the only thing that was wrong, I might be able to overlook it, but he's hemorrhaging around the greens. He is not putting well. Um, he, is, he looks very far from himself. So other than the idea that he is going to chug maple syrup this week and kind of just have that flowing through his veins and he's going to play well. Um, that's the best case that I can make for him because the statistical case is, is not really there. Davis Thompson, just like pull my string and loop back like every Davis Tom, like every week I'm like this guy, this guy, this guy. And I still think he's on the verge, right? I mean, T2 at, the, at Merle Beach Classic, T17 at the Charles Schwab. He's got a bunch of top 25s recently. He's like, he's, he's rounding into form. This is, this is happening for him anyway. Um, the Canadian that you might consider if uh, there's going to be a, probably a lot of run on Nick Taylor and, and Adam Hadwin is Taylor Pendrith. He's got the skill set that sets up best for Hamilton. Um, missed the cut at the PGA Championship, but he lost a half a stroke there. So he missed the cut, what, on the number? Gained strokes off the tee, lost a little bit on approach, which is fine. A small gain around the green and he lost a stroke putt. Like this is, this is like a nothing. Like this is, hardly a, a blip on the radar to, to have a, a fairly solid PGA championship, miss the cut on the number. Like I don't care at all, especially when, um, you know, you're coming from, you're coming from, uh, you know, T10 at, at the Wells Fargo championship, for example, and not to mention the win at the Byron Nelson, two straight top 11s before that. So, I mean, like this is, if you got, if you got punished, if, you know, 10% ownership, which is the most that, uh, Pendrith has had since the Mexico open in February. If you were one of those who got punished on him at missing the cut there, forgive quickly would be, would be, would be my suggestion. Davis Riley, 300 to one winner last week. Congrats. Davis Riley, absolutely not on my radar whatsoever. Um, I want to look up Robert McIntyre for a second and I want to look up Seamus power. So let's start with Robert. McIntyre. I got to see how he's driving it because we've gotten a couple of good results. Okay. So drove it well at Myrtle Beach, drove it well at the PGA Championship, finished 13th and 8th there, gave it all away, lost a stroke off the tee, was really bad on approach at the Charles Schwab, missed the cut. Wouldn't mind trying that out one more time. Okay. Would, would not mind trying that out one more time. He's, he's decently long in this field. He's not going to be able to take Rory lines, obviously, but he's, but he's, decently long. And then Seamus Power, who is not, but Seamus Power has been starting to put together some decent results here. And I just want to see where he's at. So missed the cut to Byron Nelson. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is a very, I mean, look at this, uh, plus 2.5 minus 2.8 plus four and a half minus four plus 4.4 minus two and a half plus four. So I guess via the pattern, we are headed for a minus four missed cut. (laughs) But if you don't believe in that, there are at least ups there's at least upside here right so that's that's um seven events four of them he's gained at least two and a half strokes to the field and has finished inside the top 25 this will be probably the weakest field that he's seen during that period so he is at least showing the upside there and he will not model well because of this every other miscut type of type of situation 6k range what can we glean from here? Last 36 rounds, Andrew Novak's the best player in the field. He's gaining half a stroke per round. Okay. Uh, Alistair, Alistair Doherty, I believe is how he pronounces this. He just was in it on the corn ferry. So now we're getting guys. Yeah. Okay. 
So you can find some diamonds in the rough here. Um, so primarily a corn fairy tour player he finished T 36. What was that last week at the advent health championship or the week before not last week, last week was Knoxville. Then he played the alternate field event in Myrtle beach and finished T two. Now he putted the lights out. That's not going to happen again. Eight strokes gained putting, but he gained four ball striking and 3.7 off the tee. Is he long? Is he long? He's got some decent corn fairy results, obviously a little bit of, um, yeah, he is long. So he doesn't have enough. I mean, he's got like one qualified PGA tour start, but 307 driving distance on all drives that would rank him again. That is one start in Myrtle beach. That would rank him like third in this field, fourth in this field, almost certainly top 10. So interesting. I'm interested. This is where you start to find some of these guys that are uh, kind of between tours and trying to figure out, and which is why I love the the uh, the global cheat sheet here, right? Because you can just hover and see, oh, that was a Corn Ferry event. Oh, that was a PGA Tour event, right? So, you know, go check out rickrungood.com. So um, where was I? Oh, I'm sorry. I was I was not even scrolled. I was scrolled down. The best player in this field is Richard T. Lee in the in the Oh, he's in the six, he's in the fifty five hundred dollar range. So he finished eighth in at, on an Asian tour event, twenty second on the Asian tour, thirteenth on the Asian tour, twenty sixth on the Asian tour, missed the cut at the Korea Championship, T sixteen on the Asian tour. So he's been crushing the Asian tour. I don't necessarily know how that translates. Obviously, he's going to get a, a, a stronger field this time around, but um, I don't know. We'll see. Kevin Tway. I kind of poo pooed Kevin Tway last week. I did not think last week was a good spot for him. And he played fine, right? I think he finished 20, yeah, 24th. This is definitely a better fit for him, but I hate to see that he lost strokes off the tee at Wells Fargo. I hate to see that he lost strokes off the tee at Charles Schwab. He lost, he's, he's lost ball striking in every measured event dating back to the Valspar. This is a better fit for him. The stat profile is still like the rug is about to be pulled. That's what the stat profile says. If you want to go with the eye test, I feel you. And this is a better spot for him, but the, the the rug pool is coming on Kevin Tway. That's just the way the stats look. I, I like the guy, frankly. Oh man, the the fall of of Eric Cole, sixty eight hundred dollars. My goodness, that is not great. What else do we have here? Mac Meisner, thirteenth at Myrtle Beach, fifth at the Charles Schwab. Not a great fit for him, but playing very good golf and he has a lot to play for pat and kazai are sneaky good right we haven't seen him since myrtle beach um 10th there 24th at the byron nelson 23rd in punta cana not bad there let's go to the 5k range there are guys in the 5k range richard t lee was down there oh boy um it's not great. I mean, if you wanted to take a flyer on Richard Lee, I wouldn't beat you up for that. Cam Champ, no. Can't go to Cam Champ. Patrick Fishburn is a long enough driver, 28th in distance on this field, has a couple of good results. Fourth at the Zurich, I know it was the Zurich, but 23rd in Punta Cana, 20th at Myrtle Beach. That might not be bad. A couple of these other guys here. I mean, Pearson Cootie, did not have a good Sunday, um, but has now got a couple of top 25s, finished fifth at the Charles Schwab. He's long, 16th in this field. And he flushes it. Got to get more consistent, but he flushes it. Stuart Sink, these two these two back-to-back -to -back top nine finishes are both senior tour events, so I'm not putting too much stock in that. Okay. <laughs> I'm like a Hayden Buckley truther. Um, I, he is, <laughs> he's, he's too good. Like he's got so much raw talent. So two guys. So Hayden Buckley and Trace Crow. Let's start with Hayden Buckley. He is too good to have all of this horrible, all these horrible results in 2024. He is starting to come around. And finally, T5 at the Charles Schwab where he gained 2.8 strokes ball striking. He's gained off the T in three straight. Yes, he putted his light, he putted his ears off, but 
at least he gained in those other areas. And then Trace Crow is 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 a very cheap combination of uh, long and straight, right? So Myrtle Beach finishes T32, T22 in Knoxville last week. That was the Corn Ferry Tour. Um, he had a T11 earlier this year in, in, in Punta Cana. But if you look at his profile here, last 36 rounds, where are you, Trace? He is first in driving accuracy and 53rd in distance. That's a pretty darn good combination, okay? Let's see what the model has to say. We'll run a model here on rickrungood.com. Uh, I've also loaded in Corn Ferry. We don't have the salaries yet, but Corn Ferry, European Tour, Senior Tour, when the salaries are available, those will be loaded in, but all the stats are loaded in. Okay, let's say, um, let's do the weighted strokes gained again because we've got Richard T. Lee who's going to pop up in every single stat and we got to kind of defend against that a little bit. So let's do um, 25 on weighted strokes gained over the last 36. We are then going to go with distance for 20. We are going to go with strokes gained approach last 12 for 15. Strokes gained approach around the green. Let's just keep it short term. 12 for 15. Putting 12 for 15. Okay. We've got 10 more to go. Uh, we want to stay away from course history. We could do, let's do, um, let's just do fantasy points gained. My number one golfer. Okay. Rory McIlroy. Shock. Number two is Sahith. McNeely and Noren are three and four. Taylor Pendrith is 7,600. He is fifth. EVR, Keith Mitchell, Mac Meisner. I mean, it's a very small, like short-term sample size thing, but Meisner is eighth. Adam Scott is nine. Kevin Tway is 10. Davis Thompson is 11th. Wow. Kind of love all those guys, right? Like if this was my, if those 10 were, or 11 <laughs> were my core, which they will be, because this is, you know, I'm going to save this real quick. Call it, uh, let's date this. So 240527 RBC Canadian, which I can never spell right. I did. Okay. Um, Oh, I would love this as my core. I would love that. Awesome. Okay. Hit the like button. Go subscribe to rickrungood.com. Go join the splash contest. Everything you need is in the description below. I appreciate all you guys. We're entering a, a phenomenal run. It's going to be a blast. See you on Wednesday. Good luck.